Hello, I'm Ed Needham, editor of the fabulous literary magazine Strong Words, and this is my podcast, The Five Rules of Writing. In each episode, I speak to a most excellent writer in a particular genre about how they do it. And if you'd like to know more about Strong Words, and specifically how to subscribe, go to www.strong-words.co.uk and you'll be whisked straight to the website. Hello and welcome to The Five Rules of Writing, brought to you by Strong Words magazine. This is a podcast where I talk to writers about the five things they know to be true in writing, whatever it is that they write for a living. So whether they spend their days writing the darkest histories or the lightest rom-coms, there are some aspects of their work that are absolutely non-negotiable. So sharing the five rules today are two supremely talented sisters who last year produced a great, great work of art. I don't know what the next level up from Masterpiece is, but whatever it is, this book is on it. Readers of Strong Words will know that the magazine is a big admirer of graphic novels, but Scarlett and Sophie Rickard's adaptation of The Ragged Trousered Philanthropists blew my head off its hinges. The original novel by Robert Tressel, published in 1914, is a book I had no intention of ever reading, but thanks to the Rickard sisters' version, I am not only a convert to the book, but barely a day goes by when I am not close to fainting when I think about the quality of the adaptation and the amount of Sistine Chapel-like detail that has gone into the artwork. So Scarlett and Sophie, congratulations and welcome. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. That was a, an amazing introduction and it, um, it's lovely to hear people say that they have no intention of reading the original <laughs> because it's really long. <laughs> it is it is uh, quite a monster but it, i mean your book is uh, is also a formidably lengthy work of art i mean the amount of um of uh, work that's gone into it is absolutely staggering and one of the big themes in the re- in the novel of the ragged trousered philanthropists is the division of labor so how did you divide the everest of labor that has gone into this book we have a very easy and clear division of labor which is mostly that i do words and Scarlett does pictures so if it's something to do with drawing the pictures it's Scarlett's job and if it's something to do with writing the words it's my job but for this particular book a lot of my work was actually removing words rather than writing them so um, it began with me adapting the original novel which is 255,000 words into a kind of script like a screenplay at which point I handed it over to Scarlett. Yeah, and is and is that a fairly even balance of work percentage wise in terms of number of hours involved? Because I mean the the artwork is just uh, is absolutely staggering the amount of detail that there is. I think as far as hours worked, it's probably a bit heavy on the artwork side. Yeah, I would um, agree. I don't think it's even at all. <laughs> <laughs> but but I think with uh, Sophie's genius um, equally matches the artwork, even if it doesn't take her as long. <laughs> and how did the project come about originally? Well, um, I was given the Ragged Trouser Philanthropist as a present by my godfather when I was about 13, I think. Um, and it was a really fat book and I didn't know what to do with it because it was a bit heavy going for a 13 year old yes but we we used to use it for for weighing down our tents and dens when we were were making (laughs) tents out of old sheets and stuff so it was a very useful book um and it was only about sort of five ten years ago that I rediscovered it and actually read it for the first time and then when Sophie and I uh, were chatting about what to do next after we'd written our first book Man's Best Friend um I, I just thought it would be a really good one to do because so much of the original book is descriptive. It describes an awful lot of detail. And mm-hmm. if you drew all of that, it would make a really interesting book, I thought. And for those for those not familiar with the, the Ragged Trousered Philanthropists, what, what's your elevator description of the book? <laughs> It's a book written about the working life and the family life of a community of painters and decorators in the south coast of England in 1910. So it's about the day-to-day life of 
ordinary working folk and how the system is designed to keep them poor, that no matter how hard they work, um, the system is, is arranged so that they'll never be able to quite get out of the scrape that they're living in. And that is shown in the book. What, what Robert Tressel did that was really clever is he's got one character who bangs on and on about politics and annoys everybody. And he will give a lecture pointing this out. And then the next couple of things that you see is that very thing that he's just described living out in their real lives. So it gives the political economy lessons a, an actual personal flavor and helps people to understand the real life impact instead of it just being theory. And the, the temptation to say, um, as relevant now as the day it was written is quite overwhelming, isn't it? I'm sure it's been, it's probably been as relevant every day since it's, it was published, but it is striking, isn't it? Just how familiar these themes of working people being ripped off are and the various ways in which this is rationalised. What, what sort of reaction have you had to it? Oh, it's been fantastic. We've had a lot of people um, saying how familiar it is and how relevant. And I think, I mean, in a lot of ways, it's a depressing reality <laughs> uh, uh, that it is so relevant now, you know, over 100 years on from when it was written. Um, and in a lot of ways, we we have progressed and then gone backwards again. So we're closer to where we were in 1910 than we have been during the 20th century. Um, uh, so it's been really interesting, the, the response we've got. People have been excited by it because the original um, sort of changed so many people's political lives. You know, there's a lot of people who cite it as having been a life-changing book. Um, and there's a sort of tradition of people leaving it lying around for people to find, you know, on building sites and things. And they seem to be doing that with the graphic novel now as well, which is really lovely. Ah, the, and also, I mean, you, I think you say in the afterword, or I saw somewhere that this is, the novel is one of the most started yet least finished novels. Yet you, you obviously finished it. What prevents others from getting to the finish line? From the original? Yes. Um, it's a bit old fashioned, which is fair enough since it was written in 1910. It was never published in Robert Tressel's lifetime. And I have to say that we have benefited from the services of a very, very good editor, which I don't think Robert Tressel had on hand. Um, it's not that it's badly written, there's just a lot of it. And in the middle, it's really, really depressing. Because when in the process of the adaptation, I tended to take sort of events from the plot and to make them into the shape that I think that would make the book keep traveling mm -hmm. and there was a bit in the middle section of the original novel that I was referring to Scarlett as the swamp and it was really hard to crawl out of the swamp and I think that is probably what where people get stuck okay in the original but that's unfair in some ways because I've complain a lot about it because I had to spend two years living inside it and lots of people really enjoy it so I probably should stop being so mean. From Strong Words magazine these are the five rules of writing. Okay well let's get on to your five rules anyway you've set the bar outrageously high with this book for anyone else who fancies having a go at a graphic novel but anyway here are your five rules and your first one you say show don't tell can you explain so the first thing about our five rules is that they're not really rules and they're certainly not secrets so we didn't invent any of these things and they're nothing that you couldn't work out for yourself mm -hmm. but when we thought about what was fundamental about how to make a graphic novel go well these were the things we came up with and show don't tell is something that you get taught at school when you're doing creative writing. But fundamentally, if you're going to make a graphic novel, don't use words to tell people what's going on. Use pictures. <laughs> yeah, it's very easy to fall into the, the sort of habit of writing far too many words on the page when you don't need to, because the pictures can do quite a lot of the heavy lifting. Um, and uh, so I think quite a lot of, I mean, something that we don't do, which quite a lot of um, comic artists and, and graphic novelists do use, 
is um, things like uh, tags saying, meanwhile, dot, dot, dot. You know, like we, we like the challenge of trying to avoid doing that. We so, like so in our books, the only text is dialogue. Right. Yeah. So you don't get a narrator telling you what you're looking at because you can manage that for yourself. <laughs> and and I mean, even before you started to, um, how do you how do you sort of prepare to sort of draw draw this thing? Because there, there are a lot of pages and a lot of um, images on each page. Do you have to sort of go through several rough versions before you? Not several. What what we what we do is um, so if he writes like a, a screenplay, really effectively, that's what it is. So it's got it's written as though it's going to be performed with the people's names and their dialogue and stage direction. Okay. And then um, together we go through and make a storyboard using pencil, just on you know paper and pencil in a, a lever arch file, so we can move the pages around, which actually turned out to be really. Uh, fortuitous with Ragged Charles of Philanthropist because we had a major edit halfway through and had to cut a load out and <laughs> rearrange everything. Um, and then once that's done, then I lay it out in the panels um, on the computer and then I, I draw it all on the iPad, which has been amazing. It's changed my life that because I can carry it around and do it anywhere that I am. Um, and it's really nice to draw on. I've seen some of the pictures on social media of you, you, you sort of time lapse uh, pictures of you drawing pages um, mm. on the iPad. I mean, how how long does it take to draw a page? Um, well, by the end of the Ragged Charles of Philanthropist, I was averaging about a page a day, um, which is heavy going because I I work during the day as well. I'm a freelance graphic artist, so I'm always drawing all day <laughs> and then carried on drawing in the night. You know. Um, but uh, yeah, I mean, probably probably about five pages a week on average over the course of the whole book, I would think. It does depend on what's on each page, doesn't it? A little it bit does. Well. Um, it... Tell Ed how long you've been working on the page you're doing right now. <laughs> oh my God. <laughs> I've been working on this page since Monday or Tuesday. <laughs> It is a double page spread, but even so, that is quite long. Well, I mean, I almost fell off my chair when you said you were doing a page a day because the amount of detail and just the sheer sort of quantity of imagery is uh, astonishing that you would get you you'd be able to get through a page in a day. That's, well, I, uh, I feel like if you're going to draw if you're going to draw a world, then then you know if you're going to have to draw every little aspect of it, you might as well make it interesting for yourself and put some extra stuff in there. <laughs> <laughs> have you always been a, a, a particularly speedy artist? Uh, yeah, I think I am quite quite quick. Yeah, and that but level it, of detail is something that is very scarlet, but it's all part of show don't tell as well. Because if you're going to create a world, which is what Scarlett's doing, she's she's the casting director and she is the set designer and she does all the props and the costumes and she has a lot of fun doing it but it is all part of the storytelling because a person's kitchen tells you a lot about who they are mm. absolutely as does their body language and things like that I'm, I'm very interested in I don't like to just have people's faces talking if I can help it I want them doing something so it's always moving Okay. Now then, your second rule uh, is, you're going to have to explain this one to me, you say use the perilometer. What's a perilometer? <laughs> this is, um, classically for us, a very visual idea for your podcast, and I apologise for that. <laughs> but the, the perilometer is basically a kind of graph of how much peril is going on. Okay. And it's really just old-fashioned plot and structure. So I like to... <laughs> I subscribe to the old fashioned idea that there is a, a an ideal story plot shape and there are certain things to put in certain places that will help readers enjoy it. And so I like to start at least with a three act structure and the parallelometer follows the three acts and it's like a mountain range where you've got a mountain, a peak of peril at the end of act one and then a slow rise to a slightly higher peak at the end of act two and then a dip, and then a very steep rise to the highest mountain of all at the end of Act 3 for the crisis of the story. So when we're storyboarding and 
doing the chap applying the chapters into the art we're constantly thinking about what the peril level is and whether we've got the tone right and also you can't have too much peril so one of the things that we do spend time doing is making things a little bit worse for our characters all the time <laughs> so I'll write this script thinking this is pretty bad and then Scarlett will do the storyboard and say oh shall we have something just fall on his toe here and you know just all of the small things that we could invent in each stage to make things just a little bit worse or that what the characters are overcoming even is more of a triumph that way it makes okay. what you're reading feel like it matters um, and what's interesting from that from what Sophie just said as well is it shows a little bit of how we work because we we although Sophie does writing and I do drawing we're very collaborative with it so when we're doing the storyboard we we really discuss like how to show things and why why we're making them do this this way and and stuff and so we develop it all the way through really together because we know each other very well I can put things in the script like Erin's face and Scarlett <laughs> knows that that means I want him to be reacting in a certain way you know so we've got a lot of shorthand between us haven't we yeah we have yeah and do you like sort of picking on particular characters as well do you sort of decide <laughs> uh, you know, oh, this guy's got yeah. a <laughs> miserable day ahead of him in the ragged Charles of philanthropists i don't know why but i i really couldn't help making easton's life hard work and wh which one is he he's the one sorry so he's the husband of the woman that gets pregnant unexpectedly. okay he's a colleague of owens and he does deserve it <laughs> but for some reason every time i drew him i i ended up sort of making him look a bit I don't know, put him into humiliating situations. It made him <laughs> ridiculous. Oh, yeah, for no good reason. And I sort of feel a bit sorry for him now. That I did that. <laughs> and one of the things I like about it is the the fact that the, uh, the, the what do you call him, the sort of overseer, the... Um, Hunter. The, yes, the, the character who's... who's uh, who has to do the quotes and is sort of their boss and makes he part of his job is to make their lives miserable but mm. then it later turns out that he's his life is also being made miserable um in turn you know he he has to answer to other people so absolutely and that's all part of the system that Tressel was trying to demonstrate is that it's not doing anyone any good mm. and I also really like the moments uh in between the chapters where obviously you take a pause and you sort of turn the perilometer off just for a moment and those beautiful illustrations that mark the beginning of each new chapter they're almost like they, some of them reminded me of old pub windows some of them were more like old packaging designs what was the inspiration for those uh, well as it happens pub windows and packaging design <laughs> <laughs> um well um i've got a bit of a background um in lettering and sign writing myself um so um I, it was partly an opportunity to do some interesting lettering but also i think we we really we were really aware that um the book is so long and complex that it needed to be split up in in clear defined sections so that people could just have a rest you know so to put it down they're like sorbet aren't they <laughs> <laughs> just to cleanse the palate yes yeah, quite yeah, yeah. quite now then your third rule you say use space to express time this is we're getting into physics here how do you what happens Sounds uh, like physics but it's <laughs> art this is a scarlet thing <laughs> Yeah, this is this is time and space. Um, when you're laying out a graphic novel, um, you have to think about the pacing. So you have to think about how the reader is going to be um, absorbing the information that you're giving them and what mood you want them to be in. Because you can kind of, you can increase the peril partly by the shapes of the panels um which isn't immediately obvious and I mean if no. you do it if you do it well it's not obvious to the reader that it's happening but um you can do things like stretch time out by having lots of small panels with not a lot going on in them over over a, a period of time uh, so that it feels sort of pressured like you're waiting for something or you can have um 
uh, this the patch of sunlight moving across a floor over several panels that shows the passage of time. Um, or, um, you know, you can have, it, it's very filmic, a lot of this. Mm -hmm. You can have things like, um, you know, extreme close-ups to people's faces to sort of make things intimidating or, uh, or uh, sort of high pressure or look up at a character from the floor. You know, you think about the camera angles and the, and the panel sizes. The bigger the panel, the more breathing space there is for the reader. So it calms them down. If you if you squidge everything up into small smaller panels, then it makes everything somehow quicker and faster. So yeah. it's yeah. it's a very interesting um, it's a very interesting medium to work in because you can really uh, sort of manipulate things in a, in three dimensions almost because you've got the the words that people are reading, but also the the atmosphere that they're absorbing as well at the same time. Right. And then towards the end, it goes absolutely berserk, doesn't it? Where you break out of the edge of the page and they're almost like uh, kind of Soviet art style um, yeah. sort of explosions of uh, their sort of, you know, the, the political points they're trying to make or the, uh, you know, the statements that they're making. Mm. Um, was that was that inspired by art of that period? Yeah. I mean, there's quite a bit of sort of constructivism in it. Um, it was a deliberate sort of step from their drudgy, boring, everyday lives that they're struggling to change. Yeah. And when Barrington is talking about this utopia that could be if they would just imagine it to make it a quite a different art style when we're talking about things that haven't happened yet. Yeah. And what were some of the other sort of basic problem solving issues that you encountered with the with the book? Um, there's quite a lot of stuff that we've learnt um, as we've gone along because we haven't got a, a background in in comics really. Um, it's just Sophie likes to write books and I like to draw books, so it seems sensible to do it together. Um, so we've learnt quite a lot on the job. And um, although this is our second book, our first book we did on our own and self-published, um, and this one. Um, is published by Self Made Hero, and they put us in contact with a, a really brilliant comic writer called David Hine, who worked with us um, almost as a. Me I mean, he's officially the editor, but it he, but he's um, been quite a mentor really to us in some ways, um, because he's got a lot of experience in the in the genre, and so things like uh, you know never ask a question at the bottom of a page. So, you know, so you have to turn over to find out what the answer is because it, it breaks up, it stops the reader from flowing properly. Okay. Um, you know, there's lots of little things like that. You know, if you're going to break break out of a panel, you know, have, a, have somebody breaking out of the side of a the panel, then they should be the thing in the foreground, not the background, which sort of stands to reason, but took a there bit. Were, there were also issues with language. I mean first one there being far too much of it and we I cut and cut and cut and then we still did that major edit sort of far mm. too late in the process to cut some more but also it was the type of language they used because the original novel is written with some um dialect a lot of dialect and some of the portrayal of working class people is sort of downright patronizing just you know spelling words wrong to give you the idea that they're talking in a working class accent okay so there was an element of toning that down without losing the mood and the atmosphere and also making sure that it's easy to read mm. and we have had feedback from different lots of different types of people that it is really accessible and much easier to read yes and so I'm happy that we managed to carry the mood of the original but actually made it something that people can enjoy the story and follow without having to work quite so hard yeah I can definitely confirm you know that for such a huge book it is a it is a very um it's an it's definitely an easy an easy reader it's not um there's nothing it's not an intimidating and or a sort of wall of copy um kind of book at all is it Something that we've really found as well through doing books is um, how accessible graphic novels are to um, dyslexic people. 
mm-hmm. um, because um, a few people who are you know quite severely dyslexic have read this and from cover to cover, you know, as, as one of the first books they've actually read, um, which is really fantastic. It's great to know that that it works on that level and that it's not uh, overfacing. Quite. Now then, your fourth rule, you say, make characters distinctive. What are some of the ways you might do this? What well, you'll have noticed reading The Ragged Trails of Philanthropist that there are a lot of characters in it. And, and unless you want everybody to address each other by their name, like they do in The Archers, you need to use other tricks to make sure that people know who they're looking at. So it's no good having everybody looking the same. Mm. Yeah have to think hard about, you know, I mean, with the Ragged Trousers of Philanthropists, because the cast was so large, and because most of the action takes place um, at work on building sites, it was quite easy to make the characters always wear the same clothes. Right. So that was one way that we could make it really obvious who's who, because this person always wears this and this person always wears that, which is, is harder to do in other books with other situations. Um, and um, we were also quite keen to make sure that it was diverse. Um, the original, of course, you know, being written when it was and being based loosely in Hastings, although the the actual book says that Mugsborough is a long way from the sea. So he's making an effort for it not to be Hastings, but everyone kind of knows it is. <laughs> Um, it's quite a kind of white um, environment. And I was really keen to make sure that the, the diversity that, that existed at that time was, was represented as well. So, um, you know, we try to kind of, you know, make sure there's as many different types of people as we could. Um, the, I mean, because of the original being very descriptive, um, most, well, all of the main characters are white um, in this one. But um, the um, there's quite a lot of other stuff, which I, I really enjoyed drawing baddies. I found that drawing baddies was so much more fun than drawing goodies because you can really give them personality and, and sort of um, lay it on thick. <laughs> <laughs> in a way that you can't really do with with a goodie in the same way because they're meant to somehow look good. <laughs> I really like the vicar with the exaggeratedly white teeth for, as a sign of <laughs> insincerity. That's a, an excellent kind of little touch, I think, that communicates that immediately. It's quite fun when, when we're first looking at characters and who's you know what what people are going to look like and who's going to be who. We actually. Um, reference people that we either know or we you know actors or whatever so we'll say oh what what about making them like Penelope Keith or something you know <laughs> um, yeah, that vicar that you mentioned was definitely referred to as Tony Blair at one point wasn't he <laughs> yeah he was loosely Tony Blair yeah <laughs> it's a was. starting point yeah it's, they're all, they're the all people look, it's their habits and their speech it's the way they go about things so there's one character in one of Owen's workmates in Ragged Trials of Philanthropists that's always got his mouth full. You know, there are there are people that are always doing their characteristic thing, which helps to separate There's them. one who always lies on the on the dresser. In yeah, the he's always sort of lounging about when he's supposed to be working. But the other thing about characters is that in this, I mean it's a bit it's particular to adaptation rather than writing, really, but if you have a character that's not adding anything to the plot and not representing anything that isn't that's covered by other people just lose them there mm-hmm. are several people in the ragged trousers of philanthropist that have been written out i'm afraid <laughs> nobody seems didn't make to the cut. nobody's complained yet so if you've <laughs> noticed then they, they get understood very good now number five rule number five you say love your book which uh, obviously you had you had moments um where you found that rather difficult, if you call the being in the middle of it, being in the swamp. Um, <laughs> how, how did you get out of the swamp? We do have a bit of a cycle, don't we, Scarlett? Well, particularly we do. you do. Yeah, I have a real emotional roller coaster. So <laughs> when, when we first have the idea for a book, it's really exciting. And we think, oh, this is going to be the best book in the world. And it's so exciting. 
And then Sophie goes off and does all the adaptation while I'm doing something else. And then when she comes back with the um, the script, I start drawing it and I start thinking, is this a good book? Are people <laughs> going to like it? Is it going to work? And then I sort of think, oh, maybe I'm not drawing it as well as the last one. And, you know, like all of that sort of thing. And then I sort of think, no, just 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 accept that it's going to be fine so I draw it all thinking oh god and then at the end of it when we look back on it I sort of think blimey that's all right actually it's always a surprise (laughs) well I I think it's almost universal isn't it among writers that they have this uh, they get started they get into it and then they have this just moment of absolute bleak despair where they think you know this is the biggest pile of rubbish you know what was I thinking and I think you (laughs) somewhere it says you know, Robert Tressel, as you mentioned in the afterward, f- found his book rejected by so many publishers. He at one point threw it in the fire. Yeah. yeah. I mean, yeah. <laughs> it didn't get quite that far. <laughs> <laughs> but I think it, it really helps being two of us. I mean, uni- unity yeah. of strength and all that. It really does help because it means that we we sort of egg each other on and you know, if one of us is feeling wobbly about something, the other one goes, No, it's great, you know, and and so it, it kind of helps us keep moving on. I think it'd be very easy to be overfaced if you're just one person. That's it must it. be a lot harder, you no, know, for graphic novelists, uh, that are more so than authors, to contemplate the idea that something is not working. You know, it's bad enough for authors, I suppose. They have to scrap a couple of thousand words, but the thought of having to redo pages and pages of all this magnificent art, you know. I that, don't know, that, actually. I think it. I think it is probably similar to to writers because I mean it, it I think it probably comes from a similar place um and we did have to do that we, we threw away pages of art for for the Ragged House of Philanthropist that were already drawn and I, I, I didn't think it hurt my feelings more than yours didn't it yeah it didn't really bother me because I, I knew that it was for the best that it was the right choice and so um yeah it was just it was just time that I'd spent, but that doesn't really matter, you know. The point of the rule, the love your book rule, is actually to do with loving it after you've handed it in to the publisher and carrying mm-hmm. on loving it. Okay. Because I think it's really, I think sometimes you hear um, creators and writers sort of feeling a bit gloomy that people are not, that, that um, their book's not getting the attention that they thought it would. And I think it's important to remember that nobody really loves your book baby as much as you do. And the best person to talk about it is you. And you need to carry on doing that, even if you're working on the next thing, to keep it up. Because there are people that want to read it, but if they don't know it exists, they won't be able to. Quite. And to rely on your publisher or, or you know, book selling people, um, it, it's not fair because they don't know it as well as you do. And has it opened any unexpected doors for you? Um, I think well, the pandemic's kept quite a lot of doors closed, <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> <laughs> metaphorically speaking. But we've done some very interesting Zoom stuff with some like political things, haven't we? Mm. And I think I think it is. I mean, I think just just having done it all together has opened. A whole door because we're now working on the next one which will also be published by Self Made Hero. And what is uh, the next one? Uh, it's a, an adaptation it, it's very it, it was written at a similar time to the Ragged Trousers of Philanthropists um, and so it's another adaptation of a, of a book which was in a similar vein but about the suffrage movement, Votes for Women. So it was written by a woman called Constance Elizabeth Maud um, and in the similar way to the Ragged Charles of Philanthropist is trying to get people to understand socialism from the inside out. She's doing the same to try and encourage working women to get involved in the suffrage movement. So, so it was a contemporary novel. Um, so, yeah, so it's going to go quite well with, with the Ragged Charles of Philanthropist, I think. Um, and I it's very witty and, and sharp. Yeah, it's well It's well written. The title is No Surrender, and it's um, uh, it written in a similar way in the sense that you've got both sides of the argument portrayed, but it's all in the context of real human lives and personal stories as well. 
So. Fabulous. Well, I urge anybody to buy and read uh, The Ragged Trouser Philanthropist by Scarlett and Sophie Rickard. It's published, as you say, by Self Made Hero. It costs £14.99 and it's, it's uh, you know, it would be cheap at, I'm not quite sure how that saying goes, but anyway, it's absolutely <laughs> magnificent. And I and I, I can't imagine anybody would be uh, in any way disappointed uh, if they were to pick that up. It's, it's so uh, immersive. And, um, you know, as I say, I was I was a bit kind of eh, when I first saw it, because it's not a book that I've ever been interested in. But within within a page, I think I was absolutely mesmerized by it. And uh, so there you go. I really hope everyone, I hope you find an enormous audience for it because it absolutely deserves it. So well, thank you so much. That's lovely. Well, Scarlett and Sophie, thank you so much for joining me today. Thank, thank you. From Strong Words magazine, these are the five rules of writing. 